So we are on chapter 7.3, A New World Empire. And we're going to be talking about the rise of Macedonia, Alexander the Great, the spread of Greek culture, and the division of Alexander's empire. So you can see here this a picture of Alexander. There's so many pictures of Alexander the Great. So many statues. He was very popular, very famous, and had a huge empire. The rise of Macedonia. So, uh, Macedonia is the northern area of ancient Greece. The Greeks claimed that Macedonians were barbarians. So, but the Macedonian kings, they claimed and they admired the Hellenic Greek culture and they wanted to be very cultured. So basically the Greeks would call them wannabe Greeks, you know. But in 359 BC, Philip II, became king of Macedonia. And he was determined um, to be king all over Greece and wanted to spread the, the, the Greek culture. But soon he conquered all the outlying regions there and advanced towards Greece. Um, and then turmoil in Greece that was happening then made them ripe for a conquest. So here we have the rise of Macedonia. Here we have, these are all pictures of um, Philip II and he was um, basically um, the son of King um, Imitus, or Imitus the third, and his um, and the father of Alexander the Great. So here's a picture. They say that he was blind in one eye. So um, Demosthenes and um, Philip. Demosthenes urged um, the Greeks to unite against the Macedonians. And so the Greeks were thinking, oh, we don't want these Macedonians. In 338 BC, Philip conquered almost all of Greece. And he didn't treat Greeks as the enemy at all. In fact, when he conquered Greece, he basically um, wanted to spread the Greek cultures. And he developed what was called the Hellenistic or Hel Hellenic League. The Hellenic League um, was organized by Philip to spread um, Greek culture. And it allowed self-government. He let the Greeks have their self-government and hoped that they would willingly join in the conquest of the Persian Empire, which was already their long-standing enemy. So his idea, Philip's idea, was to conquer that Persian Empire totally. So, which there it was, remember we know, we have the stories of how in Thermopolis and all that, that Xerxes lost a lot of, lot of his um, ships and a lot of his men, but still there was the Persian Empire. And so Philip wanted to conquer it. So basically this is a picture of um, Demosthenes and basically um, him thinking um, that he wanted to actually war against um, Philip, which it which didn't work. So um, if Philip avoided war with the Greeks and hoped they would be submissive to Macedonia, but Demosthenes, leader of Athens, spoke out against Philip and Macedonia. He didn't like the uncouth Macedonians and said and said all of Greece should unite war against them. Well, that didn't work. Philip conquered Greece. Alexander the Great. Philip's son. Well, the Hel Hellenic League um, declared war on Persia. So Philip declared war, but before going to war, war with Persia, Philip was assassinated the next year. And so Alexander, Philip's 20-year-old son, took over. Alexander assumed the ro role of the Macedonian king or Macedonian throne. And he was well-prepared, well-trained in his father's army fearless, valiant, and a very able leader. Here, so here we have um, Alexander Greek on his famous horse there, you know, so. He was also a pupil of Aristotle, huh? So, he, in fact, his dad had brought Aristotle there to train his son in the proper Greek. So Alexander was age 13 when he became a pupil of Aristotle. And knowing Aristotle, he was a very famous 
Greek philosopher. There's only like three philosophers that we're really familiar, and that would be um, Socrates, uh, Socrates and Plato and then Aristotle. But Aristotle trained Alexander. Alexander loved the Hellenic culture, which was the Greek culture. That's another name for Greek. And he memorized Homer's Iliad, and like most, most young um, Greeks did that were under Aristotle. And um, he thought of himself that he was the new Achilles hero. So he believed that he was godlike as being the king of Macedonia. So he, d he definitely had this um, thought that people should worship him. Um, he vowed to spread the Hellenic culture wherever he went. In Daniel 8, 5, it says, um, there was prophesied two centuries earlier of Alexander's charge-like goat with a single powerful horn trampling everything in his path. So if you look for Daniel 8, and it doesn't talk about Alexander or say his name, but it basically um, tells of how the Greek culture would come in like a goat uh, with a powerful horn trampling everything in his path, even onto Persia. And that ram with two horns representing Persia. It's such... It, the, the whole prophecy in Daniel is so specific that it, you would know for sure that it had to do with Greece coming in. It's amazing to read it, and that's how the Bible is. Very prophetic. Alexander's conquest in 334 um, BC. Alexander crossed the Hellespont, which is in Troy, and he had 35,000 soldiers, Greek and Macedonian soldiers together. The thing about Alexander, when he went into war, he would bring in engineers, surveyors, geographers, naturalists, and all to bring in samples of plants and everything. When he went in, he just thought, yes, in his mind, we will conquer these people, so we're gonna need to build up their cities and we're going to need to build them the way a Greek would build their cities. So he defeated the Persian forces at Granicus River and Isis in Asia Minor. So basically you could hear his picture of them coming, coming forth. Everything he set foot to do, Alexander conquered. He subdued Syria and Palestine and Egypt. He took strongholds of Tyre and Gaza after these sieges. You can look these up on your map. In 331 BC, Albella um, Al near the Tigris River was defeated. So all of these places were defeated over and over as he went through. And the Persian army under Darius III um, was taken, actually, and captured. Uh, and he captured, he went on to Babylon, Susa, and Persepolis, or per Persepolis, as you'd say it, and he found all kinds of treasures, and he took in the treasures. Indeed, Alexander had conquered the world. And as he went in, he went into India in that area, and that's where he wanted to finish his conquest. The Tyre Persian Empire, which was that world at that time, at least his world, was his. But Alexander had a tragic end, and we all know that story. Um, he could not resist the lure of further conquests. Uh, in 327 BC, he invaded India to add this whole subcontinent to his empire. But, you know, his troops were very weary, and they, many of them refused to march. They just couldn't march on, and they wanted, they wanted to go back to their families. So he finally agreed to turn back after someone gave him a bad omen that something bad was going to happen. And so Alexander, he did not realize that God had permitted his conquest to carry out his divine purposes. No, and we know later on, and you'll see why, why the Greek culture is so important and that the Greek culture actually having this empire at this time was important. And we'll see that. So here's a couple pictures of um, Alexander and his horse. I think it was named Bucephalus. He was all into that horse, that black horse. Alexander in Babylon. So here's Alexander in Babylon. In 323, Alexander had a long drinking bitch. Well, he drank 
he drank um, quite a bit anyway, so we don't know if that was normal or not normal. But at 32 of age, um, he possibly died of poison. But now they're looking and they don't really think it was poison. They think it was GBS. GBS is Guillain-Barre syndrome. I think um, your dad, George, had that. And it's when you start getting paralyzed, it's a virus that actually reacts and starts paralyzing um, your body. And I believe he paralyzed his lungs because that's why they thought it was a poison because he was being paralyzed. And then he was in a coma for a while and they thought he was dead. And so, which is very common with Guillain-Barre syndrome. So maybe, they don't know for sure. But Alexander left behind an empire of Asia Minor, Egypt, Mesopotamia, to the Indus Valley in the east. Alexander did have a son by a Persian. He felt like all of his, all of his um, commanders, all of his army should marry Persian women so that they would have a combination of Persian and Greek ancestry so that it would unite the countries together. So he did take a, a Persian wife and um, this and the Persian wife, they did he did have a baby, so he ended up, you know, um, I think she was pregnant at that time and had a one-year son, but he did not give um, the kingdom, the empire, um, under his new son at all. Instead, we'll find that he split, uh, he said that he would split up the empire and whichever general, basically just giving that that the generals would probably fight. Here's a picture of um, Alexander. Well, it's a, just a, a picture. I mean, I'm sure they didn't take a snapshot back then, but what it would look like with his general standing around him. Alexander's spread of Greek culture. Alexander won the respect of those he conquered to unify them with diverse cultures. So he won the respect because he went in. He didn't just he didn't go in and take away their culture. He let them worship as they went into worship. He, he let them live as they would live. But he declared himself the Oriental God King of the East. So of the East, he's already that King of the West. But he went into the east and he just figured, yep, I'm your, I'll am your, i be your your king. You know, they worshipped a lot of, especially Hindus, worshipped a lot of gods. And he declared that he was one of them. He and his soldiers took the eastern and Persian wives to fuse cultures. I told you about that already. So he had a, a Persian wife. He taught um, the toleration of customs. We went over that. He let the Jews worship God in a traditional way. So even in, in Israel, he let the Jews worship. Wherever he set foot, he introduced the Greek culture. A blend of cultures here. And we have Alexandria here in Egypt, and he will talk about that in a little bit. But this whole area, of course, uh, is, you know, we have where Israel, Lebanon, Syria, this whole area, of course, Alexander had conquered. Alexander spread the Greek culture and set up, set up cultures and built cities. And he left Greeks to rule land. He, um, and the Greeks became a common language. Like he said, when he, when he went into rule, he let, them, he, he let them have their culture, but he introduced the Greek culture as better. And that influenced a lot of them in changing things over to the Greek culture. Alexander adopted the Persian styles and customs, but also brought in the Greek customs. And he combined Egyptian, Indian, Persian, Greek cultures. Um, that cultural blend is known as Hellenistic after Hellas, which means Greek. So, um, and he combined knowledge and le knowledge of science and medicine and all these discoveries as he brought in the Greek culture. And we'll talk about those later too. Alexandria and Egypt. Alexander built cities which looked like Athens and he had 16 cities for himself named Alexandria. Can you believe that? But the first was in Egypt and that's the most famous city of Alexandria because it becomes a flourishing city. Alexandria became the most important city in the Western world and Alexandria um, spread the Greek language through that city far and wide and founded other colonies um, that had the Greek culture. He, the spreading of Greek culture became his most lasting contribution to world history and helped prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. 
the division of Alexander's empire. Well, in Daniel, it prophesies of that too. So it's like Daniel was writing down history before the fact. But he said that, that basically that this empire would be developed, divided into four, which it was. Here's, here's Alexander's four generals. So Alexander said his empire would go to the strongest of his generals and they would have a long power struggle. They did. And the Battle of Epsis, the ba Battle of Epsis in 301 BC was so important because that's where they ended up um, going to battle for the land and the land was, uh, was, was actually divided into with the four generals who declared themselves as kings. In Daniel it says, the great horn was broken and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. That's in Daniel. And it was broken, broken up into four parts. After the battle of Epsis, um, Ptolemy received um, Egypt. That's one of his generals, Ptolemy. And they, he ruled for, for many, for quite, quite some time during those times. And even we think of the Ptolemies as, as Egyptians, but they were not, they were Greek. Um, Lysimachus um, received Thrace. It says Trace, but I think there's an H, Thrace and Western Asia Minor upon his death, and he, that was all broken up. So like, Synthus had a smaller, but it was, um, it was towards the, the Greek, the Greek um, area of Greece. Seleucus received Syria, Mesopotamia, and Persia, and Cassander received Macedonia and part of Greece, and that soon passed to Anagonis um, Gonatus. And Agonis Gonatus. Okay, got that? But here's a picture of Epsis in 301. What happened in 301 is these generals went to war. Um, and as they went to war against each other here, we have another one of um, Antiochus or Antigonus right here. Anyway, they're fighting amongst each other. And they end up, one brings in these 500 elephants to fight. Um, that is... Um, uh, so Seleucus brings in those, and he ends up get, getting control of this area and dividing it up. But it was a major battle because it was so huge. There was 75,000 soldiers on each side, and they had cavalry and, and that came in, and they had um, a fighting with elephants. He had, uh, I don't know, I think it was 500 elephants, did I say? I think it was 500 elephants, and the other side had 50 elephants, but the elephants kind of won the war in the midst of all that. So you can look that up. Epsis. Some people say Ipsis, but I think it's Epsis, 301. The strongest generals uh, turned to dynasties. So the three ruling families remained um, after um, st that striving for power after Epsis. There were four, and then as, as um, one, one dies out, they end up the Ptolemies um, are in Egypt, Seleucids, Seleucids are in Syria. The, um, the Antigonids are in or Antigonids are in Macedonia and um, Greece, and they held power until the first and second centuries BC, and when they were defeated by Rome and absorbed into the Roman King um, Empire. So here we have here's a picture of the fighting of the generals. They kept fighting. And that was a weakness too. And that's how Rome actually got to conquer them because, because each one of them were weak because they fought each other and strived in that and did not trust each other. So we know how easy it was for Rome to come in. And we'll talk about that later in Julius Caesar. And so the fractured Greek empire, you can see this is the area. This is uh, Ptolemy. This is the Seleucus or Seleucid. So we have the Seleucids there. This is Arabia that has, is on its own. Actually, it's all desert there. The Lysimachus uh, and Cassander. These three ended up, these two are fighting now. Which, well, first, they were all fighting against one other guy that came in to try to take them over. Then they didn't unite. And it ends up um, that the kings of the north and the kings of the south attacking each other. They'll have a battle here. Constant battle. Here's Epsis. Here's a couple other places that they battled. You can see where they brought in the elephants there. So, and this actually is, is in the Bible too. It talks about the king of the north and king of the south and these battles there, which happened just like 
just like we knew it would, that the Bible comes true because the Bible's prophesied and everything in the Bible is true and right. But anyway, let's stop there. <laughs>